Hello everyone, welcome to the daily newspaper analysis brought by Shankar IS Academy. Today, 27th November, displayed here are the list of articles that we will be discussing. The first article, NIA begins probe into three Manipur violence cases. The National Investigation Agency has launched an investigation into three Manipur violence cases, which includes abduction and murder of six children and women. So, in this background, we are going to discuss the basics about the National Investigation Agency from the prelims point of view and uh, the newspaper is the Hindu. And the second IMD cyclone developing in Bay of Bengal and heading to Tamil Nadu. So this is about the, the recent warning of Indian Meteorological Department about the development of a cyclone in the Bay of Bengal and its travel to the state of Tamil Nadu. And this article is taken from the newspaper Indian Express. And the third article, National Green Tribunal issues notice to center on expansion of glacial lakes. And this, uh, this article is talking about the expansion of the number of glacial lakes in the Himalayan region and uh, related to this, the National Green Tribunal has raised a concern and issued a notice to the central government to look into this issue. And this article, we will be discussing the basics about the National Green Tribunal and the features of glacial lakes and uh, its raising concerns. And uh, this article is taken from the newspaper, The Hindu. The fourth article, why income tax department has issued PAN 2.0. This article is talking about the project PAN 2.0, which is recently approved by the union cabinet. And in this topic, we will be discussing what is this project and what is the PAN system and what are the benefits of this project PAN 2.0. And this article is taken from the newspaper Indian Express. And before getting into the discussion, we have an important announcement from Shanghai IS Academy. It is regarding the pre-storming UPSC prelims test series 2025. The batch 3 has already started, but the registration and the admission is still open. Link for the registration will be given in the description. Do register, take test and crack the prelims. Now, let us get into the discussion. National Green Tribunal issues notice to center on expansion of glacial lakes. So, this article is saying that the National Green Tribunal has issued notice to the center government indicating there is a expansion of the glacial lakes in the Himalayan region. We know how these glacial lakes are formed, right? The glacial lakes are formed due to the melting of glaciers. But if there is an increase in the glacial lakes, then it is indicating an accelerated melting of the glacier. The glacier melting is a biggest concern related to the climate change and it, it has a lot of catastrophic as well as socio-economic socio concerns. So, without much delay, let us get into our discussion and we are going to discuss this article from the prelims perspective. So, how to approach this article from the prelims perspective? First, you have to understand about the basic facts related to the National Green Tribunal. For example, the Act, its jurisdiction, its year of formation, its composition, such things you have to note. and then. The second part you have to understand about the aspects related to the glacial lakes and uh, glacial melting because it can be asked in the UPSC from geography part. So, without much delay, let us get into our discussion. As so, we will begin with the National Green Tribunal. We know that it is a statutory body established under the National Green Tribunal Act in 2010 and it is established in the same year 2010 and uh, the nodal ministry uh, for the National Green Tribunal is the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change and it is headquartered in Delhi. And the objective of the National Green Tribunal is effective and expeditious disposal of environmental cases, simply meaning reducing the burden on the regular courts and, is, and ensuring rapid environmental justice. So, it is an exclusive uh, autonomous body, so it is an exclusive tribunal that is dealing with the environmental sustainability and the environmental justice. So, keep that in mind. Coming to the key features of the National Green Tribunal. First, it is a statutory body. It is established under the uh, National Green Tribunal Act 2010, we already said. Coming to the composition, it has a chairperson and other uh, expert panel and the chairperson will be mostly the current or the former Chief Justice of India or the, the chairperson will be mostly the present or the former Supreme Court Judge or the High Court Chief Justice. And the expert committee include experts from uh, judicial background as well as experts in the field of ecology, environment and biology and also sometimes anthropology. Coming to the jurisdiction of the National Green Tribunal, the National Green Tribunal can take up cases that are registered under the following acts. They are the Environmental Protection Act, Air and Water Act, Biodiversity Act and the Forest Conservation Act. Imagine that you started a textile shop or a text, not a textile shop, a textile company in a neighborhood and you started polluting the nearby uh, water bodies, then the community in that neighborhood and the people in the neighborhood can approach the National Green Tribunal saying that this person and his enterprising is violating the environmental norms and polluting the water bodies. Then the National Green Tribunal will ask you to pay a particular amount as compensation and sometimes it includes reverse measures also. For example, if you 
cleared forest imagine that you cleared or you cut 100 trees for the construction of your factory then you have to plant 100 trees so that is how it is working coming to the powers of the national green tribunal coming to the decision making it is a quasi judicial body and the decisions delivered by the national green tribunal are binding but you can go for appeal the appeal can be directly made to the supreme court of india and uh, it ensures justice through providing compensation to the affected communities and also through relief measures that damage the environment and it is working based on the principle of the polluter pays and the precautionary principles that is like i said if you violated the environmental norms if some community or the neighborhood got affected with that then you have to pay the compensation amount to the community because recently we discussed and uh, we discussed a plight of uh, two villages in haryana which was uh, you know affected by the uh, stone crushing and the uh, mining activities for the last one decade so you can watch that video for more clarification if you need now moving to the next slide it is about the glacial lakes so this is the second part we know glaciers one of the geomorphic agents right so how these glaciers are formed we already done a video when we discussed the tajikistan issue right we will just revise that imagine that this is a mountain located in russia or in the arctic region and this region the precipitation will be in the form of snowfall and over a period of time snowflakes will be accumulated in this depression and it can it can go under compaction and high pressure result in the formation of glacier and the major feature of this glacier is the the uh, the bottom or the inner part will be relatively warmer while the outer part will be relatively cooler therefore a tension will be happening within the glacier as a result of the uh, the inner part will melt slowly and it will start retreating and this is how the glacial lakes are also formed because the retreated glacier will trap in some depressions and it can form glacial lakes so moving on glacial lakes like i said the glacial lakes are formed due to the water uh, accumulation from melting glaciers and there are uh, different types of uh, glacial lakes for example uh, sometimes like i said the retreated water or the retreated glacier can melt uh, and a trap in certain depressions can form the glacial lakes and it can also form through damming because we know that the glaciers will deposit debris known as moraines it includes you know rocks and all this moraines will act as dam and it can trap the glacier uh, the glacier and melt it so this is how sometimes the glacial lakes can be formed and ice dammed lakes sometimes the ice itself ice itself can act as dams can form the glacial lakes and the another process is the permafrost thawing permafrost means uh, frozen soil found in the higher altitude especially in the antarctic and arctic region uh, due to the climate change if you look the present but due to the climate change uh, for example if you read the today's newspaper you can see that uh, the norway uh, not norway the finland uh, they did not they are, they are recording a rapid melting of glacier and they are you know they are missing that uh, uh, the christmas ambience they had few years back so the permafrost thawing can lead to formation of glacial lakes coming to the impact of the glacial lake expansion it uh, considers it has two major impacts first, first one will be the environmental impact and second one is the socio economic impact environmental impact includes the increased glacial lake outburst flood risk because we know that in 2023 the state of sikkim witnessed to this and it took at least 100 innocent people and the alteration of the river system sometimes uh, the glacial lake outburst or the you know the debris can change the course of river and the loss of biodiversity once there is a glacial lake outburst it can destroy the surroundings and it can kill the flora and fauna located in that specific region coming to the socio economic impact threat to the communities living in that region and infrastructural damage for example hydro projects will be located in the glacier dams can affect it due to the glacial lake outburst and also agriculture losses and the economic cost economic cost means cost of reconstruction agriculture loss we know that right the the farms will be affected and it can be destroyed if there is a glacial lake outburst moving on to the certain mitigation strategies first uh, strategy is exclusively focusing on monitoring and risk assessment for example if you take the europe they have something called the cryosat the satellite is exclusively for you know uh, monitoring the health of the glaciers and like that in india we have something called the national glacial lake outburst risk mitigation program which is also exclusively focusing on regular assessment of the glacier health 
and we can also have certain uh, drainage and engineering solutions for example constructing artificial dams or constructing artificial barriers to reduce the risk of glacial lake outburst and finally ensuring the community participation through community uh, based awareness programs and mitigation training and also through training programs so in this topic we discussed uh, two major topics first one is national green tribunal and second we discussed the glacial lakes and its related aspects so try to answer this prelims practice question the question is which falls under the jurisdiction of national green tribunal one environmental protection act 1986 two forest conservation act 1983 biodiversity act 2002 and four air prevention and control of pollution act 1981 option a 1 and 2 only option b 1 2 and 3 only option c 2 3 and 4 only and option d all of the above the answer is all of the above moving on to the next article taken from the indian express why income tax department has introduced pan 2.0 from that heading itself we know that this article is talking about the project pan 2.0 which is recently approved by the union cabinet so what is this project pan means we know that permanent account number the the project pan 2.0 means an upgradation in the permanent pan system what is mean by pan system pan system is a is a system which tracks all major financial transactions of individuals in the nation for example if you take an account uh, in sbi for example uh, there will there you will have a separate sbi account number which is used to track all the major transactions that you've done through the bank if you go to another bank then you will have a separate account number in that bank to transact to track all the major transactions that you've done through that bank but this permanent account number will track all major transactions that you've done in your life and this present project pan 2.0 is an upgradation because it includes inclusion of digital vault unified portal and qr code the objective of this project is to ensure rapid financial uh, redressal at the same time rapid financial grievance re redressal and seamless integration so without much delay let's get into our discussion before that some of you might have this card or some of you might have seen this in your parents hand this is what we call the pan card so in the pan card you will have you will you can find the uh, pan holder's name his father's or his mother's name then the date of birth and the permanent account number the permanent account number if you not it is an alpha numeric pattern right uh, if you have a pan card if you notice it will be like a b c d 4 3 2 1 and the in, the number will be ending with another alphabet so this is what we call the alpha numeric pattern and uh, in the below uh, you will see the uh, card holder signature but the present system uh, under the present project pan 2.0 there will be a qr code for seamless integration and such changes will be brought on this card for both the coming uh, for both the new card as well as for the existing cards First, we will start the discussion with the question what is mean by PAN? Just now we ex uh, explained PAN means permanent account number which consists of 10 digit alphanumeric identifier and it is issued by the Department of Income Tax and uh, this is used to track all the major financial transaction and the details uh, uh, that is stored in this card will remain unchanged throughout your life. Therefore, it can be also used as, a, as an ID card. And coming to the eligibility or who should get a PAN card? Every individual who are earning taxable income should have a PAN card, not only them. For example, if you are earning, uh, if you are working uh, in an uh, institute, definitely they will ask PAN card. And the business uh, for filing income tax returns, for example, the business entities uh, should have this PAN card, uh, PAN card to show their business transactions, exemptions or, you know, uh, to document their, uh, their profit, everything. And the entities engaged in financial transactions like TDS, TCS, property purchase or investments. That's what I just mentioned. Business ent entities they should have this PAN card to, uh, to document all their major transactions. And uh, not only for this, if you want to uh, start a trading in stock market, then you should have a PAN card. So PAN card is compulsory for all major transactions. So understand this as a general point. This can be asked in UPSC this year because of this project 2.0. Moving on to the legal provisions, the PAN card is mandatory for all uh, taxable income earners under the section 139A of the Income Tax Act 1961. And it is essential for filing income tax returns, opening bank accounts and for larger scale transactions. For example, if you want to invest in a stock market or if you want to purchase a piece of land or if you want to invest in real estate, then you should have this bank card. Coming to the features of this 
project PAN 2.0, it will have a QR code. Like I said, under this project PAN 2.0, both new cards as well as existing cards will have this QR code. And the upgradation will be done free of cost. This is another uh, major feature of this PAN 2.0. And then the purpose of this QR code is better integration with the income tax department. Because we know that uh, scanning and taking data through QR code is much more easier than other complicated paperwork. And moving on to the next that is the unified portal. A unified portal will be opened under the project 2.0. This will provide, you know, opportunity. It will provide services like uh, application, grievance redressal and also and other paperwork. So this unified portal will done those paperwork without much complication and that too without paper. Therefore, it is both environment friendly too. And then we have a data vault which will be launched under the PAN 2.0. This data vault will uh, ensure the cyber security because we know that the details of the PAN will be collected by, uh, let's say, for example, the, the, the banks and the insurance companies. So this data vault can be used to preserve or protect the data of the uh, card holders and then business identifiers. That uh, for, uh, The next major initiative of this project 2. is the integration of the business identifiers. For example, at present we have three system. Apart from PAN, we have other two system that is TAN and TIN. This PAN card will be held by all uh, taxpayers in the country, both employers and employees. And this TAN, that is, that is tax deduction and collection number, this is held by uh, this will be held by the employers and then we have something called TIN that is taxpayers identification number. This is coming under the GST. Okay, this is used to track the uh, transaction uh, uh, between, you know, through the uh, transaction of the business states in the case of interstate uh, business or transaction. And uh, what is the TAN? The TAN means deduction of the tax uh, from the source of income. For example, if you are working in a company and you are earning uh, at least 1 lakh, and a particular amount, for example, 10,000 rupees will be deducted from the source of income itself. That means you will be getting only 90,000 rupees after de deducting the tax. And TIN, it is uh, used to track the uh, profit or the transaction that is done in the case of interstate business. So this is usually, th and uh, another major feature of this TIN is, it is, an, it is also alphanumeric number, but it will have 11 numbers. Okay? So that can be asked in UPSC because that is a, there is a minor trap. So that can be asked in UPSC. And then technological upgradation. This is another major feature of PAN 2.0. Because through digitalizing uh, the system, we are supporting the digital taxpayers. So uh, for, that, for that purpose, we are taking support from IT sector. This is a major initiative. And then free upgrade for both existing and new cards. Because we know that at present, nearly 78 crore people in India are holding PAN cards. So the upgradation... To, under the project 2.0 will be done free of cost and then the simplified compliance because the digitalization of the PAN system under the PAN 2.0 will ensure seamless integration with the in income tax department at the same time it will make uh, opportunities for a rapid uh, you know grievance uh, redressal and all so therefore this will reduce the complexities that we are presently facing in the PAN system and what is the need for this project that can be a question a common question because it enhances security the first major reason is it enhances security because we know that we have something called data vault right it will be used to so, uh, store the uh, the financial data of the card holders and then we have the ease of doing business because uh, this project 2.0 is reducing or you know the distracting the complex structure of the present pan system through you know through integrating the pan holders through a unified portal speed redressal measures and also seamless integration with the income tax department and all and then the in integration the next major benefit and the modernization because it is very suitable for you know uh, ensuring uh, tracking the data uh, of the financial transactions at the same time it, uh, it will ensure uh, that uh, the tax money is not going anywhere else at the same time it will be very use, uh, suitable for it sector people because you know they are it is very suitable for the modern taxpayers because they can pay the tax through digitalization and free upgrades. This is a, another major uh, initiative because at, at currently 80, 78 crore people are using uh, this pan, uh, the normal PAN card. So upgradation will be done free of cost. These are the major benefits of the PAN 2.0. And here we have certain key facts related to the, uh, the present 2.0.
first one is at present 78 crore people uh, of india have pan cards and uh, under under this project pan 2.0 the government has allocated a budget of 1435 crore and the benefits just now we discussed uh, simplify taxation filing and securing financial transaction i hope you understood so try to answer this prelims practice question the question is which of the following individuals not uh, required to obtain a pan card option a a salaried individual earning income earning taxable income option b a business entity filing income tax returns option c a minor with no taxable income and option d an individual undertaking financial transactions above specified thresholds so this is an easy question definitely we know that people with a, a taxable income they should have pan card business entities they should have pan card at the at the same time they should have tan because you know they have to deduct the tax at the same time they have to document the tax they should have both pan and tan and the fourth option an individual undertaking financial transactions above specified threshold for example if you are making a huge transaction uh, let's say 50 lakh or 1 crore then you should definitely have pan card you cannot do that without pan card so the answer is very simple the answer is option c a minor with the not taxable income is the correct answer yes that is the correct answer i hope you understood the topic and the concepts so let's move to the next article coming to the next article imd cyclone developing in bay of bengal heading towards tamil nadu so this is again november december month last year also chennai witnessed a flood and heavy rainfall and this year same yesterday chennai witnessed a heavy rainfall and another according to imd that is indian meteorological department another cyclone is developing in bay of bengal and it is heading towards tamil nadu and it, in this background it is very important to understand what is cyclones and its basic facts first we are going to see what is mean by cyclone we all know that cyclone means atmospheric disturbance usually defined as you know a large system of cloud surrounding a low pressure zone right the major features of the cyclones are heavy rainfall and uh, uh, thunderstorms at the same time the common features of the cyclones we know that heavy rainfall wind these are the major features of the cyclone and let us discuss this topic from the prelims point of view first we are going to see the reasons behind the present cyclone intensification the first major reason is the warm sea surface temperature because we know that a sea surface temperature between 27 degree to 30 degree is idle for the formation of cyclone because low pressure is important because the cyclone will be like this and it will be rotating a low pressure zone right and then we have the low wind shear that means calm atmosphere is important uh, for the cyclones to maintain the vertical struct storm structure for example like i said the cyclone will be looking like this right if there is you know unequal or if there is any other kind of atmospheric disturbance for example you know frequent wind and all this will disrupt this pattern or this this will disrupt this uh, you know this uh, the structure of the cyclone and eventually that will become uh, that will make the cyclone weaker and then smaller land interaction the bay of bengal is free comparing with the arabian sea at the same time the bay of bengal is shallow too therefore it is an ideal position for cyclone formation and and the lack of land nearby makes it more intense because we know that once the cyclone touches or makes its landfall then it will lose its moisture and uh, eventually it will become dead and the other favorable atmospheric conditions in the bay of bengal such as the high pressure systems and the monsoon dynamics we know that the southwest monsoon as well as the retreating monsoon brings a lot of moisture to the bay of bengal at the same time and the uh, and the land around the bay of bengal will be relatively cooler therefore it will have high pressure so this forms an ideal condition for the formation of cyclones and finally the coriolis force very important the coriolis force we know that the force which is generated due to the rotation of planet planet earth is known as coriolis force and this coriolis force has a capacity to deflect the matters for example imagine that this is the earth and this is the equator and this is a northern hemisphere this is a southern hemisphere and uh, this um, the coriolis force will deflect the matters towards the right side in the uh, in the northern hemisphere and the left side in the southern hemisphere and this is a major reason behind the anti clockwise or counter clockwise nature of the northern hemisphere cyclones and the uh, clockwise nature of the southern hemisphere cyclone and in this picture you can see the structure of the cyclone so this is a sea this is a sea surface and you can see that an uh, cyclone will have a circular shape and it will be surrounded by a rain band which is formed due to the uh, the 
convection which is formed due to the convection that means the rise of the warm air and it will cool down here and the rainfall will happen and uh, in the middle we have something called I and uh, the center the low pressure of this uh, cyclone will be relatively warmer than the surrounding and at the same time there, there will be a downward movement of a warm wind so these are the these are the structural features of cyclone this can be asked in the UPSC and you can refer the NCRT for better understanding and coming to the role of the Bay of Bengal in the cyclone formation because the Bay of Bengal is meeting all the prior requisite for the formation of cyclone for the formation of events like cyclone for example the warm water because like I already said the Bay of Bengal is a shallow bo water body uh, therefore it can be heated easily and then the funnel shaped geometry if you look this map you can see the the Bay of Bengal is surrounded by the Indian subcontinent Bangladesh Myanmar and the archipelago of the Southeast Asia this will give uh, you know uh, an opportunity for the cyclone to concentrate in a particular region and increase its intensity and uh, next one is the monsoon influence because we know that the monsoon will bring moisture to the Bay of Bengal in in the case of India we have a uh, two type of monsoons first one is the southwest monsoon and the second one is a retreating monsoon both this monsoon will bring abundance moisture to this region and uh, therefore the bay of bengal will um, every year will record at least four to six cyclonic events but at the same time this is creating huge catastrophes to the local communities especially the coastal communities living in myanmar bangladesh and uh, india and Bangladesh is one of the frequently affected region or the nations due to the cyclonic activities in the Bay of Bengal. And the in the coming to the case of India, this is state of Orissa and the state of West Bengal. So in this topic, we discussed what is cyclone and what are the reasons behind the cyclone intensification in the Bay of Bengal. And with this understanding, try to answer this prelims practice question. The question is, which of the following is the primary reason for the high frequency of cyclone formation in the Bay of Bengal compared to the Arabian Sea? Option A low wind shear in the Bay of Bengal, option B, warmer sea surface temperature in the Bay of Bengal, option C, greater land interaction in Arabian Sea and option D, stronger upper level divergence in the Bay of Bengal. If you look the options, you can see that all these options are correct. But the question is, which of the following is the primary reason for the high frequency of cyclone formation in the Bay of Bengal? So, the answer will be option D that is the warmer nature or the warmer sea surface temperature in the Bay of Bengal. Yes, the answer is option B. So, now let us move to the next article. Coming to the next article, NIA begins probe into three Manipur violence cases. We know National Investigation Agency, which is formed after the Mumbai terror attack in 2008 under the National Investigation Agency Act 2008 to investigate into uh, terrorism related crimes or brutal crimes that is affecting the sovereignty, public order and the integrity of the nation. And uh, this National Investigation Agency has launched investigation into three crimes in Manipur, which includes abduction and murder of six women and children on November 11. So, let us discuss more about the National Investigation Agency in this background from the prelims point of view. First, we will start with an overview. What is National Investigation Agency? It is a counter terrorism agency launched, established under the National Investigation Agency Act 2008 and it is headquartered in Delhi and uh, like I said it is formed after the Mumbai terror attack in 2008 and the parent ministry for the agency is the Ministry of Home Affairs. This is a brief overview about this organization. Moving on coming to the mandate, it, uh, it can investigate into scheduled offenses that is mentioned under the, uh, under the National Investigation Act and such crimes are terrorism related crimes crimes that are affecting the India sovereignty and integrity particularly uh, you know the in uh, for example uh, such if if there is any crime that affects the India's relation with the friendly nations or uh, for ex uh, or uh, crimes that are planning to attack atomic facilities or such uh, crucial areas then the national investigation agency can investigate in in such cases and uh, cross-border offenses that include smuggling human trafficking and cross-border infiltration and all these kind of cases can be investigated by the National Investigation Agency and then international obligation. For example, certain crimes that is affecting the uh, trade relations or treaties or agreements between the nations that can be investigated by the National Investigation Agency. Coming to the powers of the agency, we can see that they can investigate without the prior recommendation or the permission of the state. And the National Investigation Agency can take up the cases whenever it is recommended by the central government. If the central government finds that uh, such cases has national or international relevance then they can recommend or they can refer that cases to 
na national investigation agency and the state governments can also refer cases to national investigation agency via the central government and uh, it can also investigate as per the recent amendment the national investigation agency can investigate the scheduled offenses just now we saw that is committed outside india by the indian citizens so they can investigate that too this amend this was this provision was brought through 2019 amendment and another basic feature of the national investigation agency is the national investigation agency special courts this is established under the section 11 and 22 of the national investigation agency act and this functions as sessions court sessions court means sessions court with the exclusive jurisdiction over the scheduled over the scheduled crimes and the judges to the sessions court are appointed by the central government in consultation with the chief justice of supreme court or the high court and the cases if there is any delay it can be transferred between the special courts but that will be done by the high court or the supreme court to reduce that time and coming to the persecution the court can persecute uh, the individuals who are charged under act like uapa unlawful activities prevention act or similar act like that then they can be punished by the sessions court coming to the recent amendments to the national investigation agency act 2019 it was done in the year 2019 and uh, the amendments widened the scope of the investigation agency through empowering the investigation see through empowering the nia to investigate in human trafficking cyber crime terrorism etc and also this uh, 2019 amendment granted special powers to the national investigation agency under the explosive substance act 1908 and uh, the next feature is the global jurisdiction that means here after the national investigation agency can investigate the cases or the crimes which are committed outside india and uh, the next is the designation of the special courts that is here after the central government or the state government can designate the sessions court nia sessions courts or special courts and uh, coming to the significance of this national investigation agency first one is the centralized uh, counter terrorism efforts for example if you take a crime for particular period of time the crime will be investigated by the crime branch then it will go to cbi like that so the this kind of transfer of cases can affect the the facts or uh, the investigation but the nia is a centralized organization for counter terrorism efforts therefore it will improve the uniformity and efficiency of the investigation and the next is global reach here after they can investigate the crimes which are committed outside india and a deterrent to terror financing that is deterrent to terror financing that is the nia can track and uh, check the uh, flow of money that is supporting the terrorist networks or other anti social networks and the judicial efficiency we just saw the sessions court of nia they can charge the individuals under the uapa and similar acts so these are the basic features of nia which you should be remembering for the upsc prelims so with this understanding let us move to the next article and before that we have a prelims practice question so the prelims pa- practice question the question which of the following offenses falls under the jurisdiction of naa as per the 2019 amendment to the naa act option a human trafficking option b counterfeiting currency option c cyber terrorism and option d manufacture of prohibited arms select the correct answer using the code given below option a 1 and 2 only option b 2 and 3 only option c 1 3 and 4 only and option d 1 2 3 and 4 the correct answer is option for all the above can be investigated by the national investigation agency uh, as per the 2019 amendment with this we are coming to the conclusion for today's newspaper analysis if you like the video hit the like button give your feedbacks as comments and share this content with your friends and before leaving this channel don't forget to subscribe and also hit the bell icon to receive on time update from shangrai's academy thank you for today